All right, friends, we are continuing this morning in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Today we are in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to pick up reading here in verse 9. Inside of the Gospel of Matthew, we are in our series within a series on the Sermon on the Mount, paying very careful and close attention to a lot of the just incredible things that happen inside of this passage of Scripture. And this morning, we actually come up on uh, maybe one of the more familiar passages, maybe in all of Scripture. And so this morning, we're going to talk about prayer and what Jesus teaches us to pray. Friends, prayer is at the very core of our lives with Christ. Prayer is our indispensable activity. Prayer, friends, is a life-changing and world-changing conversation with God. Prayer is not something that some disciples do some of the time and a few of us do all of the time. It is not something that we achieve in our walk with God is a prayer life. It is essential to our daily lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So it is not at all surprising that the greatest sermon ever preached teaches us how to pray. Now, before we actually begin reading through what Jesus uh, tells us here, I want us to remember the main point of this section of Matthew chapter 6. So let's read again Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says this. This is his big idea, and it leads into his teaching on almsgiving and prayer and then fasting as well. Chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Christ's main point is that we should not put on masks as the hypocrites do. We should not parade our religiosity in front of people so that they may see us as special people who pray, so that they may see us as especially religious people. Jesus is going after this way of doing things where we clean the outside of the cup, but our character remains unchanged. So Jesus says, beware of practicing your spirituality in front of other people to receive your praise and acclaim from them because if you do that, you're going to get it, but that's all you're going to get. But we are learning instead how to live our lives and to worship for an audience of one. We live our lives under the gaze of God. We worship for the presence and the glory and the magnificence of God and who He is, and we are learning in our lives, living from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit to live for this audience of one. So with this topic of prayer in this particular passage of Scripture, we're going to get to talk through two passages of Scripture this morning. And the first is what we almost always call the Lord's Prayer. If your Bible has section headings, that's the section that, um, that gives you the, the, your, your definition for what's happening in this passage of Scripture, the Lord's Prayer. It is, in fact, technically, Jesus teaching us to pray. And so, in fact, some people like to call it the disciples' prayer. It's what Jesus is telling us to do inside of our prayer lives. So if it's Jesus teaching us to pray, what is it that we're going to learn inside of the Lord's Prayer? And then we also get to talk about fasting a little bit this morning. Now, there's a lot to teach about fasting, and Jesus is not giving us a great, big, long teaching on fasting and how to do it and when to do it. He's placing fasting inside of the context of our prayer lives. So if this is part of our prayer, our relationship with God, then how should we do it? What does fasting look like inside of the life of the follower of Jesus Christ? How should we fast and why? So let's begin reading with Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus says, so pray like this. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. If you grew up in a traditional church, a liturgical church, you might have actually prayed this prayer every single week with the rest of the congregation. And some of you are thinking, why does Phil's version leave off that last phrase? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Why would we leave that out? That's the best part of the song anyway, right? Some translations have that, some don't. Um, and so some of your translations put that in uh, because some of the ancient texts have it and some of them don't. So it just depends on your translation whether or not it has the doxology part of the Lord's Prayer, a beautiful piece of the Lord's Prayer. But it's very familiar. If you know a biblical prayer, this is the prayer that you know. And in fact, when Jesus gives this to his disciples, he models it after a type of prayer that was prayed often inside of their synagogues. It was called the Gadosh, and it had a certain form and shape, and it was something they prayed every single week. And Jesus doesn't quote from it, but he uses some of its structure so this passage has become familiar to us, to the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus had actually picked something that was familiar to the disciples as well to say, now you might be used to pray, be praying like this. And so here's what we're going to do now as the people of God. And here's how we are going to pray together now, even as followers of Jesus Christ. So the passage is very familiar. But I'm here to ask you this morning to make this passage of Scripture even more familiar to yourself even more familiar to the life of the church. Jesus begins this by saying, pray like this, so it is a teaching tool, what we read here inside of this prayer. So if Jesus uses this as a teaching tool, I think it is very good for us to slow down, to kind of take this bite by bite, to sort of soak through the vocabulary that Jesus gives us so that it can become our vocabulary. To think through the things that Jesus says phrase by phrase so that we can understand the ideas, the concepts, the important things that Jesus puts across as he teaches us this Lord's Prayer. And because this is a teaching tool, Jesus gives it to us, and so then it actually becomes ours to pray. It becomes ours to internalize, to learn what it is, to maybe even memorize the phrases and to internalize it inside of our lives. And then it becomes ours to teach and to pass along. Jesus gives it to us and then we walk through it and we learn it and teach it and pass it along to other believers, to new believers, to the next generation of believers so that we might learn to pray the way that Jesus is teaching us to pray. So I'm going to encourage us to learn it, to endeavor to learn the Lord's Prayer, and to use it, as a matter of fact, as a tool in our prayer lives. Now remember, this is not a mechanistic, legalistic, magical kind of prayer tool. This is not something that we just repeat over and over again because Jesus tells us, say these words and repeat it over and over again until something actually happens. Jesus, in fact, is teaching against that form of prayer in this passage. Read again chapter 6, verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. So that's not what Jesus is teaching here. He wants us to slow down and understand the things, the ideas he's putting across as he teaches us to pray. So friends, the Lord's Prayer, I believe, can actually become a very powerful front door into a time of prayer. I would encourage you to learn how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. Some of the most significant times of prayer that I have had personally have had to do with the Lord's Prayer. I will take a situation that I'm praying about or I am praying for. 
I'll take an individual, a, a family, a group of people that I am praying about, and I'll lay that out before God, and I will use the Lord's prayer as reminders, as ideas, as ways of talking to God about what it is I have actually laid before Him. So thinking about the situation, thinking about these individuals, I will begin to pray, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I'll stop. And I will just begin to pray in those terms for whatever it is I have laid out before God. And you'll find sometimes, actually, you may never actually get past that first phrase. <laughs> God gets a hold of you and you begin to pray and it becomes a rich and powerful thing inside of our lives. So that's actually a lot of what we're going to do this morning. Is we're going to slow down and we're just going to kind of soak through the things that Jesus gives us here to pray. So Jesus says, Our Father, who is in heaven. When we pray, Our Father, we learn that we have a surprisingly intimate contact with the Creator of the universe. The one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one before time began, the one who will be there after time ends, the one who is perfect and holy in all of his righteousness above the universe who counts all of the stars by name is my Father. We have this intimate contact with that God. Friends, philosophies and Religions from around the world have argued for the existence of a God or posited the existence of a God that is so far distant that God has nothing to do with us. That God is so complete in his own perfect holiness. He is the creator of all things, but he is too holy and perfect to touch this sinful earth. And so he is distant. He is unapproachable. He has nothing to do with us. But along comes the one true God who walks in this flesh and says, I am your father. So we learn we have this surprisingly intimate connection to the creator of the universe. When we speak our Father, we recognize the authority and the guidance of our divine parent, <laughs> of our Father figure. We recognize our status as His sons and His daughters. He is God and I am not. He is Father and I am His Son. So we learn His direction. We learn His place in authority even inside of our lives when we speak those simple words our Father. I'm going to try to get through this this morning. Our Father is in heaven. Our God dwells in righteous perfection. Though His eyes are upon me and His care is with me, and even though His Son entered this flesh, and walked on this earth. His throne is in heaven. He is not separated from me in this life, but he dwells in his eternal, holy, perfect righteousness in heaven. This place, friends, where his children are eventually headed. And to me, friends, this is actually very powerful comfort. The one true God who actually exists is aware of the brokenness and the filth and the turmoil of this life. The one true God is not only aware of it, but he is at work within the lives of his children inside of it. God is present and powerful. Psalm 105 verse 4, Seek the Lord in his presence and his power. He is present and he is powerful. But the filth and the evil and the turmoil of this life does not diminish his glory by an inch. His throne is in heaven. So friends, I can actually rely, have faith in, place all of my hope and confidence and trust in the unchanging character and nature of God. 
My life vacillates. The seasons of my life rise and they fall. But the God who exists is the God who is here. And he is the God whose throne is in heaven. And his glory is not touched by what happens here on earth. And his steadfast love endures forever. Right? This is powerful comfort. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This phrase, hallowed, it simply means to be regarded or honored as holy. And so when we pray that, we're praying, God, I want your name here on earth in this life, in this room, in this community, in this nation. I want your name to be regarded as holy. Now, for Scripture to use the concept of someone's name, especially the name of God, it means so much more than you and I are used to with our names. It is a word, a name is, is a concept that is attached not only to an individual, but to their character and their personality and what their life is actually like. And in certain circumstances, that name actually denotes power. So it's not just a label. It's a, it's a word that is full of content. And so when we pray something like, in Jesus' name, we're not just calling him by name, we are invoking the power and the character and the goodness of God when we pray in the name of Jesus. And so we pray, may your name be regarded as holy. We want God's character to be honored. We want his will to be desired among as many people as possible. Friends, the greater God is, the better off we all are, right? So we pray. Father, may your name, your power, your will, your character be regarded as holy, as right inside of this life. Instead of everything else I regard as important, may you be regarded as important here. May your name be hallowed in my home and in my family. May your name be hallowed when we gather and sing your praises. And Father, may your name be hallowed in our world. May you be regarded as holy Instead of the things that we regard as right and good, we want to regard you, Father, as holy. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. This part of the prayer begins with the idea that God reigns supreme inside of heaven. Now, Matthew loves using words of king and kingdom, and they're words that are a little bit antiquated to us, but their understanding is, uh, an understanding of it is actually quite easy to get a hold of. A kingdom is where a king has his way. Where a queen has her way is a queendom. As far as that kingdom goes, that king or queen are just going to have their way. That's the region of their power. So how is it that God reigns in heaven? God has his way perfectly in heaven. So you and I are praying, Heavenly Father, what is your perfect reign in your presence? May it become that kind of reign here on earth. May we be conformed more and more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. This is important stuff. As Matthew tells it, it's John the Baptist's first sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As Matthew tells it, it's Jesus' first sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God reigns perfectly in heaven. But we are broken. We are short-sighted. We are sinful. We are selfish people. I'm here to make you feel good about yourself this morning. 
And so we pray, as our Savior teaches us to pray, that his reign will increase within us. Because I know what is broken within me. I need more of God and less of Phil. Because we know what is broken in this world around us. We know we need more of God and less of all of that. So we learn in Scripture through the words of Christ and John the Baptist and all that we are going through. God's reign is here and active and powerful among his people at work within Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit, but it's not perfected here yet. It is here in pieces. It is here growing in the lives of his people, but it is not yet perfect. And so the kingdom of God has this character trait to it that we often call now and not yet. Repent, for the kingdom is here. It's now. Christ has come. The Spirit of God is empowering his people. The kingdom is here. But all of us know that we are on a journey toward the kingdom of God, so we pray. We want more of the reign of the kingdom of God within us. So we pray for God's rule to grow on earth. In one of those primary ways, I find this fascinating as we pray through a passage of Scripture like this, one of the primary ways that God's rule increases on earth is that God's rule increases in his church. So when we are praying, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, be ready. <laughs> because we are praying for us. We're praying that the church will drop all of its sinfulness and brokenness and walk closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Friends, the reign of God is the kind of thing that can be an ever-increasing power in the lives of his children and in the lives of his church. It's like standing on the shore of the ocean, and we begin just taking steps in the ocean, and the ocean's only so deep. We get a little bit further, and it becomes deeper, and it's almost a little bit overwhelming. Friends, the further we walk into the ocean, the deeper and greater it gets. Let me tell you something. The further we walk in our lives with Jesus Christ, the greater he becomes. The more of him we want, the deeper he gets, the more powerful he is. We think we have a taste of him now. Walk with him more and learn how great he can become. Some of you remember a, a prayer I prayed here uh, from this pulpit early on uh, this year, right at the beginning of this year. And it's a prayer that I have been praying for this uh, church uh, for this entire year. It comes from one of the visions that God gives the prophet Ezekiel. And in essence, in nutshell, the vision is this. God takes Ezekiel to the side of the temple and he sees this river coming out the side of the temple. And as God walks him through it, it's it's up to his ankles. He walks further in it. It's up to his knees. He walks further in it. It's up to his waist and up to his shoulders. And eventually the, the image is as if he's walked so far into that river, it upends him because it's so deep. And everywhere that river goes, trees are given life and they produce leaf and they produce fruits. Friends, keep walking in the living waters of God. Keep praying for the kingdom of God to come more and more and more. May God's will for the sake of humanity grow stronger among his church. May we grow as his followers in courage and wisdom. And may we become, as Christ has been teaching us already, salt and light inside of our world. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. So at a point like this inside of the prayer, we, we sort of turn a corner. We began with adoration and we began with praise. We began with our eyes up on God and who he is and all he is capable of doing. And now we walk into the presence of God with our petitions with our requests, with our needs laid out before him. And let me encourage you to build that habit into your prayer life. 
to begin whatever it is that you bring before God, no matter how pressing it is, to begin with adoration, to begin with praise, to begin with glorification, begin in thanksgiving to God for who he is. Christ has already told us in this teaching on prayer, you don't need to babble over and over and over again because your Father knows your needs even before you bring them. So we can rest in that, and we can let the second half of our prayer be our petition. And we can let the first part of our prayer be, oh God, how great are you? <laughs> and may you become greater. Give us this day our daily bread. We unashamedly ask God for our daily needs. There's no shame in this. There is nothing that is lowly spiritually about doing these kinds of things. Christ teaches us to come to God asking for our daily needs to be met. And when we do this, we are learning that God is my provider. God is my strength. God is the one who is my source of all that I need. Most of us take a paycheck home and someone else's name is on that paycheck and that paycheck is a good thing. It pays for the roof over our head and the food on our table and the clothes on our back. But that paycheck is not my provider. My provider is God. And friends, we are learning when we come to God this way that God has resources money cannot buy. It does not matter how large that paycheck gets. God is greater. <laughs> and he produces more for his children than we could ever ask or imagine. Scripture says he is our provider. A passage is familiar to some of you. It comes from Psalm 37. The psalmist says this. I like this prayer. I have been young, and now I am old. Isn't that deep? How many of you have prayed that prayer? Oh, God. I once was young, but... Hmm. <laughs> I have been young, and now I am old. In other words, I've seen a couple of things. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. God is ever lending generously. And then you and I who have received generously, we become a blessing. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors. Forgive us our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. We learn in Scripture of the character and nature of God. Scripture says a few times in a few different ways that God is slow to anger and he is quick to forgive. He is abounding in mercy, Scripture tells us. But we also learn in the kingdom of God that you and I are learning to give what we must receive from God, and that is forgiveness. This is a stark passage of Scripture. And when we slow down and spend time on it, it gets a little pointy. And we want to move very quickly on to the next phrase. <laughs> but it's important. In the kingdom of God, you and I are learning an attitude that is ready with forgiveness. This kind of thing is just not natural for most of us. But it is God's heart toward me, and in his kingdom, it is becoming my heart toward other people. Now, this is becoming one of the themes, one of the sub-themes of the Sermon on the Mount as we walk through this. As we hear what Jesus says, what life is like inside of his kingdom, we're also having revealed to us what life is normally like inside of this sinful heart. You see, it is normal for me to be ready to be angry. I am ready to be bitter. I am ready to hold a grudge. I am ready to make sure you know everything you have done wrong to me. That's what I am emotionally and spiritually ready to do. But in the kingdom of God, something else is possible. I can actually become ready to forgive instead. And what an amazing kind of freedom that is. What is normal for me, 
pulls me down into darkness and into a pit of bitterness and anger and frustration and lashing out. But forgiveness is something that is free and it's freeing of my soul. We come to a passage like this and we're, I think, forced to ask some questions. Is forgiveness or bitterness the general direction of my soul? Is bitterness what arises in my mind when I think of a situation or a person or a group of people? Or have I learned in the kingdom of God to replace that with forgiveness instead? Here's an interesting question. Because I wrote it, so I want you to know that it's interesting. Am I secure enough in God's sovereign ability to handle my life to let go of my need to control through unforgiveness? Am I secure enough in God's sovereign ability to handle my life to let go of my need to control people through unforgiveness? This is sometimes what happens when we hold on to unforgiveness. It is for us some form of control over a situation. It is sometimes a form of control over what I feel about that situation. It is sometimes even a form of control over another human being when I hang on to unforgiveness. But am I secure enough in God's good and sovereign ability to go ahead and handle my life so that I can let go of those things? Now, in the past, we've actually talked on and taught on forgiveness pretty specifically. <laughs> And Jesus isn't giving us a deep and long explanation of forgiveness, but it's important, I think, to remember a couple of things. Remember this about forgiveness. First of all, forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is something I'm commanded to give, and so I'm learning how to give it. Now, forgiveness becomes a path to trust with someone in the future, maybe, but they're not the same thing. As a pastor, I hear this all the time, but I can't trust them, but I can't trust them. I know you can't trust them. That's not what you're being asked to do. You're being asked to forgive them. Forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. Forgiveness is not the same thing as agreement. We don't have to see things the same way in order for me to go ahead and then forgive you. Then my forgiveness is conditional upon you seeing things my way. That's not forgiveness. God, while I was still dead in my sins, forgave me long before I agreed with him, right? So forgiveness is not the same thing as agreement. For forgiveness is not the same thing always as reconciliation even, and this is hard. It's a pathway to reconciliation, but it's not the same thing. That may happen later on, but forgiveness has to happen inside of my heart. And forgiveness is not the same thing as freedom from consequences. The things that I do will still have consequences one way or another, even though I am forgiven by that person. It is God's command to me to let go of my so-called right to hold a grudge and develop bitterness. Forgive me of my debts as I have forgiven those who are my debtors, who have sinned against me. This is such an important component to how the human heart changes in the kingdom of God that Christ expands on it at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the prayer, verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It is, in fact, as Christ teaches, us, teaches it to us, it is a divinely set cycle inside of the kingdom of God. There is a passage in the book of Romans where Paul quotes some Old Testament scripture and he says... God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. It is God who has decided that our lives will look like this inside of his kingdom. So you and I then live inside of his decision to set things up this way as the sovereign Lord. And so now you and I are learning to give as God gives forgiveness. We are learning to give as God has given me forgiveness. The older I get as a pastor, the more grumpy I become with graceless Christians. I'm just throwing that one out there. And it's because they are not giving what they have gotten from God. 
God has given a shocking amount of forgiveness and grace to this person. Who am I to withhold that from others, right? So living in the kingdom of God, we grow and we learn how much our daily lives rely on forgiveness and we learn to give what we receive from God, this kind of forgiveness. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is fitting that a prayer that begins with the glory and the power of God closes with my weakness. I need to learn to pray for deliverance from trials. I need to learn how to pray in order to invite God into my own weaknesses. Friends, we have an enemy, an actual enemy, who, as Scripture says, is walking about, roaring as a lion, seeking whom he may devour, using every trick he has used for thousands of years to separate God's children from him in his presence, to convince the children of God that he is not who he truly says he is or that he does not exist as all. We have an enemy who is at work doing that. And on top of that, just life itself produces enough pain and trials and difficulty. And so we pray for God's gracious and powerful deliverance from our trials. We pray for his deliverance from evil. We also learn that we are praying for his deliverance and strength through the evil that we walk. A passage of scripture that should be of great comfort to many comes from the lips of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And listen to how he has processed his own weaknesses in the presence and power of God. From 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7, he says this, So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul has this powerfully unique relationship with God. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it, should, uh, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ am I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak then he is strong. <laughs> Friends, I believe that it is only when we recognize our need of God and we recognize our weaknesses will we then begin to see his power. If we refuse to see our need of him, we won't pray this prayer. And all we will ever see is our own power and our own wisdom and our own cleverness. So Jesus teaches me, fill pray God deliver me from evil be my strength and be great in the weaknesses that my life is ju are just so full of so we do not pray in meaningless repetitious ways like the superstitious pagans do but instead, friends, you and I have this kind of meaningful, life-touching, life-changing, heart-expressing conversation with our Father, the one true God available to us. So when we pray this way, we learn to feast on God. We learn to feast in His kingdom. And so speaking of feasting on God, being filled by Him, Let's read the next couple of verses and what Jesus says about fasting in the context of our prayer. Verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. They got exactly what they were aiming for. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. 
and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Again, the teaching on fasting is vast, but inside of this context, we're treating fasting as part of our prayer lives. It is another assumed activity for the disciple, a period of time in which we abstain from food or from a certain kind of food or from a certain form of distraction or media or something, and we take that time and we give it over completely and wholly to our time with God. It's an assumed activity for the disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, because the discipline of fasting is what it is, because we often sacrifice in our fasting, because of sometimes the vigor and the effort that fasting takes, it is actually very easy to misuse fasting for the praise of other people. Uh, you will probably see, I'm just guessing, but you will probably see come Lent next year a lot of Facebook posts where people are saying, I'm giving up soda pop for Lent. That's my fast. Is that a spiritual fast? No. Is it a diet? Probably. But we like doing this. There's some sort of sacrifice. There's some sort of discipline involved. And so we find ways for other people to just kind of see what we're doing and what we're going through. So we publish it. We'll discuss the dietary goals that we're trying to achieve through some sort of specific fast. But... Again, when we misuse fasting for public praise, we do it as Christ says, as the hypocrites do. They're putting on a mask. Their character is unchanged. This is not spiritual fasting. This is so that you may think that they're great. And you know what? If you think they're great, then that's all they got. But I want you to do this in such a way that this is a unique kind of connection between who you are in the very depths of your being and your Heavenly Father. So do it in such a way that your Father is the one who sees, and the one who sees in secret, He is the one then who will reward you. So instead of all of that show and display and hypocrisy, fasting can actually become a very powerful part of our prayer lives. Three very quick thoughts on fasting and prayer and part of what it means for us. So we do, in fact, learn that we feast on God. We give up some of these things physically that we become accustomed to that feed us physically or even emotionally or feed our time and our minds, and we lay that aside and we put ourselves in front of the banquet table of God himself and we feast on what he wants to give us. Job, in one of his clearer moments, put it like this, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured his words, the words of his mouth, more than my portion of food. I have actually learned that his word is greater to me than the dinner that sits in front of me this evening. We're learning to feast on the resources of God. We are learning, secondly, that he is our sustainer and our provider, provider, even as we prayed earlier on. Psalm 136, he who gives food, he is the one who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. He is the one who gives food and his steadfast love, which endures forever. And then, friends, as we pray this way, we are actually learning how to sacrifice in order to exchange one kind of thing for a greater thing. Something that is important, something that is necessary, something that is vital, but we are learning as important as those things are, I'm going to take some time and sacrifice them for something greater, which is the presence of God. However great and important those things are, I give them up, and I seek the face of God, the greater thing. The psalmist put it like this in Psalm 84. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. If you can imagine the thousand days anywhere you want to be, the psalmist says, you know what? I'll do you one better. One day, the unmitigated presence of your heavenly Father is better than all of that. So we're learning how to sacrifice things that are important and good but are less important than the presence of God. 
May we learn to pray like this. So let prayer become second nature to us. When the Apostle Paul says, I want you praying continuously, he doesn't mean I want you babbling under your breath all the time. He says, I want prayer to become second nature to you. I want it to become your natural response to every piece of life. I want God's presence to be that close to you so that you are in conversation with Him. May it become as easy as breathing, our default interaction with life. As we said last week, may prayer become an intelligent conversation about matters of mutual concern. God is concerned about this too, so let's talk to God about these things. And may this prayer become a legitimate source of comfort and power in the lives of God's children. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. God, give us this day our daily bread. God, forgive us our debts as we learn to forgive those who have sinned against us. God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Stir our hearts, Heavenly Father. Stir our hearts in prayer and adoration. Stir our hearts in thanksgiving. Open our eyes and our lives to a prayer life that has been taught to us by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, given to us to use in our walk with you, Father, as we walk through this life in situations and in events that are so often beyond us, and we know they are beyond us, but you have not left us alone. We bring these things before you, and we seek your face through all of them. God, awaken us to a life of prayer like we have never had it before. I pray, Father, you would rise up in this congregation prayer warriors. 